Thank you for joining us. I'm Richard Curie. On behalf of the Smithsonian Folklife Festival at the Center for Folklife and Cultural Heritage, I want to welcome you all to Beyond the Mall 2021, Making Matters. We look forward to connecting with you on our digital platforms as master artisans, cooks, sculptures, and musicians from as far away as Armenia and Fiji, Peru and Cuba, right here in Washington, D.C., welcome us into their kitchens and studios to share stories and skills. Together, we'll learn about Zapotec textile dye, Senegalese metalsmithing, Korean home cooking, and much, much more. This weekend is a future-facing reflection of the festival's legacy, making community no matter the circumstance, no matter the time. As we have every year since 1967, we offer sincere thanks to all of those who open their creative lives to us, to share with us. And we hope that you take inspiration from their stories, and find collective care, particularly this year, in the sharing. Thank you. Welcome to Passing the Torch, Senegalese metalsmithing across geography and gender. Thank you for joining us. In addition to ASL interpretation, closed captioning is available for this program. So to view the captions, click CC or settings buttons at the bottom of the player. My name is Diana Beard and Jai, and I'm a cultural specialist and Smithsonian Festival curator at the Center for Folklife and Cultural Heritage, but I'm also a jewelry artist and the daughter of a metalsmith. This conversation is an activity of the African American Craft Initiative, a new project at the Center for Folklife and Cultural Heritage that seeks to identify, connect, document, and amplify the voices of contemporary African American makers. And by that, I mean artists and artisans. Please look at our website, linked in the chat, to find out more. If you don't know the festival, I encourage you to check out festival.si.edu to learn about our programs, education resources, and more. This program is presented in partnership with the American Crafts Council. So today we invite you to participate in a conversation with two bold women who are challenging convention and forging ahead into this historically male art form of metal smithing. We'll be speaking about the role of apprenticeships in Senegal, and in the United States. By the way, Senegal is at the tip of West Africa, at the, in the upper part of the continent of Africa. And we'll be talking about the chain of transmission and innovation that links three generations of experience with this ancient art form as it traveled from West Africa across the Atlantic. And we are about to meet these wonderful people, but we wanted to talk about metalsmithing, which has a very long history in the African world. West Africans were the first to innovate transformative metalsmithing techniques like the lost wax process, where metals are heated and poured into a mold to create complex pieces of art and jewelry. Women have always played a huge role in gold and silver jewelry and metalsmithing, but usually as very savvy patrons, consumers, and dressers not necessarily as makers. Now, I'd like to welcome our guest, Karen Smith, metal smith, and founder of We Wield the Hammer, and her student, Adeniji Asabi Shakir, also a metal smith. Hi, Diana. Thanks for having me. Hi, it's so good to see you here. It's lovely fact, to I'd be like seen. To, yeah, I'd love you to introduce yourselves. First, Karen. I am Karen Smith. I am a metal artist and I am the executive director and founder of We Will the Hammer, which is a program that trains young women of African descent in metal artistry. 
Great. And um, Adeniji? Yes, I'm Adeniji Asabi Shakir, metalsmith, um, sculptor more broadly in, you know, many, many mediums from rice paper to raffia and weaving. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. And I, we want to talk about metalsmithing today. And I wanted to know first from Karen, what excited you about taking up this art form? You know, Diana, it's just this thing that um, that arose organically. I used to be a beater um, and I started creating jewelry and but I had bigger visions and things that I wanted to see. And I didn't see them in jewelry. I started to see them in metal. And I because I am a former academic, you know, I decided, oh, let me go and learn how to do this thing. Um, and I looked for classes. I was gonna take, um, you know, maybe go back to school and it was too expensive. And I ended up learning on my own. I'm self-taught looking at books, watching videos and uh, trial and error. But you ended up in Senegal. So how did you end up there? And tell us a little bit more about how you ended up uh, studying with a master metalsmith. So it's really a fascinating story. Um, so I am self-taught, like I said, but because I come from a background that really values formal education, you know, I always felt pretty insecure about my abilities. And one day I had a, a couple who commissioned me to make gold wedding bands for them. And uh, of course I said, yes, because I love love. And, you know, I thought, oh, this is really cool. But I didn't have a lot of experience working with gold. I worked primarily with sterling and fine silver. And so the day they gave me the deposit to make their rings, I went to bed that night and I literally heard a voice said, you need to go to Senegal. And so I go, okay. And the next day, you know, I started thinking and sketching out their rings and same voice goes, you're going to Senegal to study goldsmithing. And so I go up, okay. And I got online and started looking for classes, started looking for universities and it doesn't work like that. I reached out to a friend who reached out to a friend who reached out to a friend and, you know, they told me the way that it works is you apprentice with someone and they gave me all the background and, you know, actually one of them tried to discourage me because in Senegal, they have a saying that women don't wield the hammer, um, that women can polish the metal, women can sell completed uh, pieces, but they don't wield the hammer. And I thought, well, that's cool, but I'm supposed to be in Senegal. And so they go, cool, let's make it happen. And so my little, you know, our little group within 24 hours, they had found, they had identified someone who was willing to um, let me apprentice with him. And I found a place to live and expats who spoke English to help with my not so great friend. So, I mean, it happened really organically and really quickly, just like that. Wow, that's amazing. Because I know that in Senegal, uh, not only uh, do women not usually wield the hammer, but mm -hmm. also it's a tradition that goes, uh, that is passed down in families and Absolutely. Uh, from father to son. That's right. Uh, so what was that experience like being a woman metalsmith in a gendered male profession? Well, what kinds of things did you learn? <laughs> I learned I'm much more resilient than I thought I was. <laughs> more than anything. Um, but seriously, I learned that um, I learned that I have um, that people are valued. And when people mm -hmm. are valued, and when people are respected, we can exchange. When I first got there, um, I don't think that uh, Monsieur So, Ibrahima So was my teacher. I don't think that he thought that I was an actual metalsmith. I think he thought that I was just coming on vacation to learn how to make a pair of earrings and, you know, maybe have some groovy experience. Um, so when he met me, he introduced me to his apprentice and to his um, assistant. 
And his assistant who spoke English showed me a bracelet and he said, so what do you think about this bracelet? And I said, did you make it? And he said, no. So what do you think about it? And so, you know, I said, well, you know, it's not soldered well. And, you know, and this is what's happening with how it's fabricated and the forging is really off. And from behind me, I hear Master So say, she should be teaching this class, right? Like they were all pretty surprised. And then I look up and all the men in the village are just standing around looking. I mean, and it was really, um, in the beginning, it was really disconcerting because I have never worked with all men before and around all men. But I think once they understood that I was serious and that I had um, already some understanding of this art form, this, this uh, vocation, I think they started to engage with me um, in a very serious way. And so right off the bat, you know, he handed me a hammer and was like, here, I want you to start forging. And so, you know, um, there are a couple photos in there of me, uh, the original photos you were showing uh, of me on my knees, like hammering um, and forging. And, and, um, and so that's, that is the very first day when I started working, um, I learned how to forge a bracelet and I learned how to hold the hammer because when you're self-taught part of part of what's um not so great about it or can be challenging is that you don't learn like proper technique right mm -hmm. and so uh one of the things on our very first day it's like this is how you hold this hammer and this is how you hold another hammer and when you're working on a small space this is what you do so wow you know and within the first week we were doing things like um he was showing me how to cast and um this is a this is a photo of cuttlefish casting uh -huh. um where he gave me an example of that so you know i think once he got clear that i was um i was already a metal artist and i was interested in learning traditional techniques and um learning how to do things properly uh, it it actually was okay. Some of the some of the problems that came up didn't come up with my teacher and his apprentice and his assistant. It came up from men outside in the village, you know, who would come in and show me how to do what I was already doing. Or uh -huh. you know, in one harrowing instance, you know, a man came in and took the torch out of my hand while I was working on gold to show me how to do what I was already doing. Right. Wow. You know, so wow. that kind of thing, whenever so wasn't out, some man would take it upon himself to show me what I was supposed to do. Oh, well, that, that's, an, that must've been a real challenge. Um, Indeed it was. Obviously you, you had to overcome. So um, we want to find out about uh, how you, translated that experience and we want to talk a little bit about Aniji, but uh, just before we do that, I would like to ask you, so what is We Wield the Hammer and how and why did you start this organization? So We Wield the Hammer is a program that I started to train young women in this art form. One of the things, well, the primary catalyst for that was this trip to Dakar. Um, and particularly there was a little girl who used to come by every single day and just stand in the doorway and watch me. And, you know, other women used to go by and sometimes they would, you know, like peek in and the older they were, you know, the more they frowned, the younger they were, the more curious they were. Um, but this one little girl used to come by every single day and look at me for months. And she would never speak to me. I spoke to this child in English and French and Wolof and <laughs> in Arabic. She never said anything. And finally, I asked the apprentice, I said, why won't this child speak to me? Why won't she talk to me? And he says, she thinks you're a ghost. And I was like, why would she think I'm a ghost? She's been seeing me every day. And he said, because she's never seen a woman do what you're doing. Wow. Wow. And so I thought, now that she has seen that, it's a thing that she might want to do. 
And if she wants to learn it, who's going to teach her? And that very moment is when We Will the Hammer was born. Wow. wow. And so because I lived in Oakland, I came back and I incubated the program there. But, you know, my hope is to bring it to Dakar as well. Oh, that's great. So it's actually an exchange uh, as much as an apprenticeship. And um, I, I want to ask you, Adeniji, what yeah. drew you to metalsmithing and how did you discover Wheel the Hammer? Wow. So I was drawn to metalsmithing before I discovered the program, but um, to the exact effect that I think Karen wanted, I did not really even imagine a program that would be able to train me in the way I was wanting or really just imagine the access. And there's spaces I'd looked um, and even kept tabs on the space that we work with at the Crucible, the Crucible, the space that we built the hammer works with. Like I had really I just, I'd had that interest, but it was so not realized to where I was looking, um, but not really seeing it. And I'm someone similar to how Karen was saying, who I'm, I've always been very, very interested in crafting. And I did start with jewelry before I started with metalsmithing and beading and wire work pretty young um, and have always been seeing things I wanna make that I just don't know how to, that are, big and broad and require a lot of force and a lot of heat, you know, uh, <laughs> heavy duty. And I've always just wanted to do stuff like that in specifically metalsmithing and studying like the seams and the, just the craftsmanship in a lot of African art that I was around growing up. Um, and the fascination with how technical, how technical it must be, but just really the fact that someone made it always fascinated me and that someone started that. So I've always wanted simultaneously to dive into the technicalities. And I think We Will the Hammer has given me a good opportunity to kind of do both of these things, to dive into the technicalities, but also have that feeling of the torch being passed. There's so much that is not exactly in words or that is not necessarily about numbers and temperature and the way you're holding it necessarily. Um, I love the quality that someone someone started this. Someone found some metal, somehow started applying heat, somehow started developing which tools work best for them, and of course that that expands into all these different art, all these different forms of it, like lost wax. Mm -hmm. um, but really, my interest has been that fascination and that wanting to connect to the root and then to dive into the technicalities. And so when I discovered We Built the Hammer, it was just kind of, I really did not, ex it sounded like exactly what I was looking for and I still did not believe it. Um, but it was just a great opportunity to be taught, especially in a space of black women and by black women in a really rigorous way. Uh, but that was also very intuitive. So I discovered it literally, I think just word of mouth, social media, you know, um, yeah. and then having a really nice conversation with Karen where we talked about all that I could imagine doing with metal. And I realized and was even more excited by the fact that she was saying, it's probably gonna be a very long process because I came in wanting to start melting metal down and like, <laughs> you know, like I was just ready. And I honestly love that I haven't gotten there yet. I love um, that it's a process. And I love that I feel held in that process by programs like the hammer, truly. Oh. Oh, that's wonderful. Actually, mm -hmm. you know, you've mentioned several of the, uh, that, that, that there are a lot of things that you can do with metal. I know, mm -hmm. Karen, before you referred to Cuddlesmith, uh, Cuddlefish yes. uh, uh, forming, and, and the Cuddlefish is, um, it's an actual fish, it's a sea creature, and... Uh, I had no idea. I had no idea that a Cuddlefish was an actual fish. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, and could you describe uh, just really quickly that that first um, technique that you were talking about so that, um, you know, if you were describing it uh, for me and I didn't have a, an image of it, what would that look like? What would you, how would you describe that? 
cuttlefish casting? Yes. So it's a it's an oblong um, it's an oblong fish, I guess, that's dried out, and um, it, it you cut it in into two parts, and uh, so it's flat on one side. It's pretty. It feels pretty chalky, and it's also very very dusty, mm -hmm. and um, and so you make an impression within that within that. Um, within the within the fish itself um and then you put the two pieces together and you make the impression either you draw it in but what i have seen them do is put in an item that they wanted to produce numbers of um and you so you press it in you put the two sides together and you and you wrap it up and there's a you make a hole in the top so that you can uh melt the 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 metal and pour it inside mm -hmm. and then it gets set. So it's a casting process like lost wax press, lost wax casting is with wax uh, mm -hmm. and cuttlefish casting is with the actual cuttlefish. And then you take it apart and then you have your pieces. You could also, I believe you could also do cuttlefish, cuttlefish casting ha, mm -hmm. with uh, wax, but I have not done that. Hmm. Okay, so that's just one of the, the many techniques that, that you've referred to. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the other technique, which I think is really, really interesting because you see it in, um, in many places um, in, in West Africa is filigree. And oh. actually one of the slides that we showed earlier was of a necklace that was a Neck, a butterfly necklace mm -hmm. that was done with filigree, and that's so beautiful. On the screen right now, mm -hmm. and it looks almost like crochet. It, it, it's little wires that are um, uh, almost like threaded together, and then there's uh, little dots, and this is all in gold. So when you feel it, uh, it has a wonderful texture of little mm -hmm. dots as well as lines, little. Um, lines of wire. So uh, can you tell us about that? Because that was the, the thing that you, one of the things that you learned there. That is one of the things that I learned there. And that that piece that you just showed, the gold necklace, that is exquisite, right? Filigree is very, very delicate and it's very, very intricate. And um, what I came to learn is it's one of the things that they start teaching uh, children. Children start apprenticing young in, in Senegal. And one of the things they learn right off the bat is filigree and chain making, because you need to be very, uh, you need a lot of dexterity and you need to have really good eyesight. Um, this is an example of chain making. So there are lots of little tiny uh, pieces that you have to cut and then form and then uh, connect and you know, so it's a, it's a long, long process. But this is, a, this is an example of filigree and that is my teacher's hand in the bottom right uh -huh. showing. Um, and you can see the scale of the, the pieces. You cut these tiny, tiny pieces and you shape them and then you fit them inside of what is essentially a mold. So on the top yeah. right, you see that diamond shape is sort of a mold and you cut tiny, tiny pieces and, and then you shape them and then you fit them in to the mold. And so you have to be very precise. You have to have a hand uh, that's very steady. You have to have really good eyesight and you have to have a lot of patience because oh, no. as you can see on the top right, that's a number of pieces that have been inserted um, just to make that small little, um, wow. that half piece. And so uh, it was so hard. <laughs> oh my because God. Because I just, you know, um, my hands aren't as, uh, I guess, as malleable as I would want. And so my hands would be shaking as I was trying to put this tiny little piece in. Um, it is when you see it up close, when you see finished work up close, but also as you're learning the process, 
you have so much regard for the skill that it takes, you know, and I, you know, my total time was six months and I am in no way adept at doing this very well. I could get by with it, <laughs> but I am not adept because it takes so much practice. Um, yeah. And it's, it's just, it's so, it's just a, it's a beautiful, beautiful technique, lots of repetition, but you need lots of patience and a very, very steady hand. Yeah. So, wow. So um, I, um, I just had to stop there because I was so excited to see your photographs of learning the skill of filigree because my grandfather, as I mentioned, was a goldsmith in, uh, in Guyana in South America. And the earrings that I'm making, which I'm going to show you, were made, uh, he made them. And I'm, gonna, I'm hoping that this will show up on this camera. Uh, oh, here. He made these earrings for my grandmother. Wow. And they're made using filigree. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can see it's the same, you know, it's the triangle. Mm -hmm. And um, so I have a question for Adoniji. Uh, so mm -hmm. did you get it? Did you try out the skill of, um, <laughs> of filigree? <laughs> I did not. The super <laughs> ambitious artist in me is like, I think I could try to hack it. Um, and the super tedious artist too. But no, I didn't try anything like that. The closest was probably like a type of joint, you know, making joints using wire and probably starting that process of learning how to solder in that really small scale way. But no, we didn't, unless I'm forgetting, we didn't do anything quite like that. We did not do that. <laughs> because, you know, and I think what, what I really want to say about We Will the Hammer and how it's different than a lot of things you see is it's actually a training program. So a lot of times you go to places and there are workshops and you learn how to make a ring or you learn how to make a bracelet or that kind of thing. We are not a workshop and we're not even a series of workshops. We're actually a training program. Mm -hmm. And so for the eight weeks, they learn how to do the fundamentals of fabrication. They learn how to handle a torch. They learn how to handle, uh, how to properly handle a saw. They learn how to solder. They learn how to clean up and finish. Uh, and they work with, they work with brass and copper and then they graduate to silver. Um, and that has been, uh, so, so that's how we, differentiate from, you know, other places. And if, if a student is interested in learning filigree, after they get done with our program, they can go on to that, but they have to have the basic skills down to, uh, to be able to work with a hammer and a torch and a file and a saw. Wow. Well, that, that is great. And that I know takes already, it's something that takes quite a while to to master and even getting uh past the fear of the torch uh <laughs> so, yeah so at mm -hmm. where do you see your journey in craft taking you from here uh what's what's next for you and then i'll circle back around to karen so yeah on the one hand i'm really dedicated in craft in general in developing my crafts and honing them more. So that's with metalsmithing, um, continuing with that. I still have so much I wanna do. I would love to learn filigree, uh, but more broadly, I really want to take my craft and just, I plan on sharing it. I, I wanna share it with people in a way of um, having really intentional and thoughtfully crafted spaces in the home. And I want that to be around jewelry and around homeware in general, and just bringing an air of, uh, and also wearables, which Karen really emphasizes oh. too, bringing an air of uh, that connection and almost that torch, that kindling in our craft. Craft is such a part of our history and such a part of who we are. And it can be hard to, even be able to be intentional about what you consume, you know? Yeah. So I just want uh, really to 
channel that and make things with love as someone who loves to craft, loves those fine, uh, repetitive things. I just want to be able to share a level of intentionality that I think sometimes we lose connection with. Yeah. Wow, that's that's. Yeah. I think that's something that really um, characterizes the the craft person's journey, and and um, mm -hmm. I think that um, we're finding that out in our project in the African American Craft Initiative that uh, people are not only interested but are passionate about um, you know learning and about passing on and. Um, what we have up on screen right now is um, one of the first pieces I, I think that, that you made mm -hmm. um, within uh, your, within the training program, We Wheel the Hammer. Could you describe it for us? Definitely. So it's one of the last pieces I made, actually. Oh, sorry. Um, oh, no, no worries. No worries. It's, um, still one of the first pieces I've made in general. And so this is part of which I hope we will show a larger piece I made with the whole core. Yeah, which is like a metal quilt concept that Karen had come up with. And so alternating here, you see a square, the more detailed squares are one from each of the students. So mine is the one with the leaves that you saw towards the bottom left. And um, it was really fun to make. It's sterling silver and brass. Mm definitely applying what I learned in um, honestly all my skills. And I think that was the intention. I applied almost everything I learned in this piece, but definitely practicing the soldering work, um, polishing the wire work, and then trying to get these, uh, this fine detail of trying to get a, trying to get a realistic mm. texture of a tree bark. Mm. So uh, that was done through um, wire, Sorry, I'm actually, I don't know the exact term, but using wire to just create all these impressions. Mm -hmm. And conceptually for me, I think I really was inspired by that sense of rekindling the craftsmanship and the, that I got through We, we Wilt the Hammer. And I sort of just intuitively came up with these, this image of a tree trunk cut off. And, you know, as happens in nature, that's never the end of the story. So uh, there's all these sprouts popping up and I felt like that was just a really um, simply put expression of how I felt in that space. That's great. I love the image of, it's the tree trunk, but it's also new growth. Exactly. You know, so I, I really love, I really love that image. And yeah. um, it's it sounds very much like, um, or t maybe, to me, it reminds me um, of the fact that both on the continent of Africa and in the United States, you know, there were so many um, enslaved um, Africans who came over because they had those skills, those very important craft skills mm -hmm. that they now had to start over in a new place. They, the work was coerced, but they came over not only to you know, Hugh Wood and so on, but because they had these really important craft skills. So exactly. um, um, I think that that's one of the wonderful things about um, your work and taking up this metal smithing, um, which also yes. takes place in blacksmithing, but, but mm -hmm. also um, with this fine metal smithing. So what else would you like people to know about African-American women in metal smithing? Uh, Karen? Uh, one of the things that I would like people to know is that we're here, right? Uh, I, my program is called We Will the Hammer because we do. Uh, it's not, we are not um, uh, an exception, um, but we just haven't always had enough access and enough opportunity. Uh, and I also want one of the reasons why I had them create a quilt, you know, it was a group project. So everybody did a square is because I'm very interested in using these traditional techniques that I learned in Africa and applying them in ways that are uh, uh, important and identifiable to us as African-Americans. And quilt making is so uh, important to our traditions and 
being able to do that in this group, I feel like brought them together, brought us together because I am a part of that quilt as well. You know, um, it's very important for me to to have both those things, uh, African traditions and African American traditions together. It's what is important to me in my own work and what I do with We Will the Hammer. That's great. And um, I guess I would be interested to know, what would people be surprised to learn about this tradition in the African and African American context? Do you think that there are things other than women do wield the hammer? But, I, <laughs> <laughs> but what are some of the uh, things that might have been discoveries um, that you didn't expect, for example, at an EG? Hmm, that is a really good question. I think that definitely it would surprise a lot of people how technical and almost chemistry, you know, technical in all the ways, but even in, for, in the way of implementing chemistry it involves. And I think that didn't fully surprise me. It's something I was really excited for, but when it comes down to how the borax is, you know, how the borax is uh, interacting with the certain temperature and how much time you have until your piece is like mush versus, it's, <laughs> it's really um, intensive and technical and fast paced and almost high stakes in a really fun way. I think it's an element that we um, we as women have, you know, we have we have that engine in us, and the mistake can just be where we don't have that access, as Karen was saying. So it's like I've always um, speaking on that, like I've always just wanted to I wanted to make things that take a lot of force and literal strength. It requires a lot of physical strength, even, but also that balance between the technicality and the fine jewelry nature of it um, just makes it that much more rich for sure. Oh, that's great. Thanks. I think it's time. This is great. I think that it's time to see some of your work, Karen. Uh, we'd love to bring some of your work up uh, on the screen. And it looks like the first one, I'm just going to describe it a little bit. It almost looks like the filigree work in a in a kind of abstract sense because it's a pair of earrings and um, it's uh, it's wire earrings and um, the shape reminds me of a woman's shape in a in a yes. way and I don't know whether you are seeing it that way Absolutely. but um, it has a smaller circle and then a larger circle and I guess if you in a band across the middle. So if you were feeling it, it would be um, like just this sinuous, sin, sinuous line and then uh, the flat and then another sinuous line. But can you tell us a little bit more about this? I actually call those my goddess earrings and you are indeed correct. They are uh, in the shape of a woman, an abstract shape of a woman. And because I do love filigree, um, I try to uh, to take some of the techniques I learned and and apply them in very very broad ways. Um, and so what you're seeing is sort of the shape of a woman, and uh, the around the middle is a belt. Um, oh. I had a series of those, and all of them were different. A couple of them had metal waist beads around them. One of them had w which something that sort of looked like an obi. Um, and so it, they were, uh, it was a series that I worked on uh, last year mm -hmm. that I was really thrilled about. What you just saw is a self portrait. So I do do wow. wearable art, but I also do fine art as well because that's where my work has led me as well personally. And so that is a piece that I created um, before I cut my hair. <laughs> that is a self portrait and that's sort of a veil uh, in front and it's oh. created with sterling and fine silver. That's beautiful. So, so it looks, I can see the hair uh, mm -hmm. at the top and then um, the, triangular piece looks like it could even be a headband and then the um the 
beads in front of the face remind me also of the Yoruba tradition of um, exactly uh, priests and kings and queens, where you you had to look at the, you couldn't look directly at them, but you had to look through a beaded mm -hmm. headdress. Were you mm -hmm. thinking a little bit about that? I was thinking in a lot of ways. It is absolutely. Uh, it was designed to be a veil because it's a self portrait, and it's called self portrait unfinished. Um, Love it. It does sort of speak to that tradition, but it also speaks to uh, a tradition of of the call the African. Well, it's not African American, but there when sometimes a baby is born with uh, still in the sack, mm -hmm. and they have a call over their face, mm. um, and they say that those children are um, sighted. They mm -hmm. have visions, and this is sort of. Uh, a nod to that as well. So, you know, it's talking about it 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 it's a spiritual piece for me as well as uh an identity piece for me. Lovely. Lovely. How okay. does it go and everything? That also is um that's a ceremonial piece that I created. It's a four foot um uh uh sacred uh necklace, we'll call it. Um, and that is created from sterling and fine silver and 14 karat gold. And um, I made that also. A number of the pieces that I have been working on have been touching on um, spirit and mm -hmm. honoring spirit and honoring um, this, the journey that has brought me here. And so that piece was intended to be be uh, displayed, that's why it's framed. But it is also, it can also be worn. Um, and it's just like a ceremonial piece um, to showcase grandeur and beauty and just to be adorned. That's beautiful. I love the fact that there's a, a collar and then mm -hmm. there's a long, uh, a long piece um, in the middle and then there's all the, the wire um, which almost looks like fiber. Mm -hmm. That's that's lovely. So there's 108 individual uh, circles that wow. go down the front, and wow. 108 is a nod to uh, uh, Islam. Uh, uh -huh. Even though I'm not uh, a Muslim, um, this tradition, as I have been learning it, comes directly from Muslims. And so uh, every day we would stop during the day for so that my teacher or you know other people could make their prayers. And so I was very, very influenced and then still am in tune with that that whole ceremony and that honoring and that sacredness. Oh, that's great. That's great. And uh, your earrings are also gorgeous. And so granulation, if I have the, the little dots right, is that? No, actually, no? Those, are, um, those are forged. And the little dots are soldered eyes. And they are, they're forged, and they are fold formed, and they are textured with a hammer. And I, these have become my signature, actually. But they were, I made those for the first time in Dakar. Uh -huh. And what's really interesting is um, there was a there was a uh, a person across from us who had a stall that sold all these masks, and so I was very very um, inspired by the masks. So I told my teacher I wanted to make these, and he was like, "Why?" And I said, "Well, you know, I've been really inspired by the masks." And he said, "Inspired? Like, what are you what are you talking about?" And so, you know, I started talking to him about being inspired and what that meant and identity and how I wanted to reflect that in my work. And he just sort of looked at me like, mm, I don't get it. And so he started talking to me about production. And we had this amazing conversation. And I learned so much about how it is that people make, you know. So I have the privilege of making what I want to make, how I want to make it as I wanna make it. If I don't wanna make something, I don't. And he doesn't, because I think about my work as art. Uh -huh. 
he is an extraordinary artist, but he thinks about himself as a producer. Yeah. And so he makes what the client wants, you know? And so we just, as I was talking about being inspired and he was talking about like the realities of eating, right? Like making to eat. Right. It right. just was such, um, it was such a learning for me. And I think there were many ways that he thought I was really, really interesting. <laughs> Oh, right? I can imagine. Um, yeah. Because he didn't engage with people in the ways that he engaged with me. Um, uh -huh. But it was an extraordinary, an extraordinary learning for me. Yeah. I didn't just learn how to use a hammer. There was a lot I learned about the culture and the practice that I had no ideas about. That's great. Well, we, we're, we're almost at a close, believe it or not. This could oh, go no. on for a oh, lot longer. So, um, but I, I uh, I have two questions. The first is, uh, this is a lovely uh, piece that uh, also Adoniji, this is uh, a ring and you, um, you're going to tell us about that. And then I'm going to ask about, to close out uh, a little bit about, you know, what are the keys to sustaining the art and the artists in this era? And what have your pivots been during the pandemic as we, uh, as we look to, to close out? So, Adeniji, uh, yeah. Um, so this is a ring. this was my first sterling silver ring that I made, and I was really excited just to work with, to get started and work with my, the level of luster, work with my polishing and texture making mm -hmm. uh, that I made here. So I used, I textured this with hammer and. Um, like a wire, a metal mesh, basically. And yeah, just got my polish on. It was really exciting and, you know, just learning the basics of creating a ring that'll stay together properly. <laughs> that is beautiful. Yeah. So our last question, you know, what about the keys to sustaining the art and, and the artist? Because yeah, actually you mentioned some of this, uh, Karen, in terms of, um, you know, sustainability means also being able to eat as well as, mm -hmm. as the other parts of it. So what have your pivots been during the pandemic? Um, well, one of the pivots actually is that the program had to shut down because we had been housed at uh, the local, uh, at an industrial arts school where I'm on the faculty. I teach jewelry mm -hmm. at um, the Crucible, which is, a, is an industrial arts school. And when they shut down, our program shut down. And we also realized during our time there that we needed our own space because we need to have time where the students can come in and practice if they want. We need to have time for them to build their skills if they want and to meet with me separately as well as to meet whenever we want to meet. Um, and so like the sustainability part is the biggest challenge, both within the pandemic and outside of the pandemic. Um, we Will the Hammer is a nonprofit, which means we are constantly uh, looking to raise money to operate. Um, and so, so that we can provide access because this program, we offer this program free to 14 to 24 year olds. Um, we, I believe, and you know, we believe that we should have access that people who look like Adoniji and who have the um, desire to learn this should have access to it. And so mm -hmm. we, we believe that access and opportunity is what will keep this tradition alive, which will in, in, enable it to flourish here, um, particularly in communities where people don't have access to a lot of money, because I mean, you can you can go and get a BFA in in joy making or an MFA. You know, those those courses are tens of thousands of dollars, right? Which automatically eliminates a number of people. There are also craft schools around, but the costs can be, you know, astronomical. I, this you know, I'm self taught because I just was not able as an artist to pay exorbitant prices to learn this. And so sustainability for me is about access um, and opportunity. Right now we are in the, we have been on the search for our own studio space. Okay. Um, 
and the Bay Area is super expensive. And so like just trying to figure oh, out man. a way to make it happen is um, has been one of the hardest things. And gotcha. and building our building our fun base. You know, we are lucky enough that we have had so much support in non-traditional ways because lots of grant makers and lots of foundations pivoted during the during the pandemic and were not taking on new projects. Right. And so we have raised so much money individually from metal artists, individual metal artists um, and that kind of thing. So that's the sustainability is in the access, making it possible so that young people like brilliant and talented young people and just people and young women in general who may be interested in another path have the opportunity to do this that that is a wonderful way to to wrap up and it's important that that all of these things um you know that people know these things and know that um you know these arts are so beautiful and uh that it takes the kind of effort and uh the kind of vision Absolutely. To, to create these. So I, I, I want to thank you, Karen Smith. Thank and you. I want to thank you, Adoniji and Savi Shakir, so for sharing your experiences and your insights and your beautiful work. Thank you and, for having uh, us. I also want to thank the audience for participating, all those who watched and listened and commented. And I also want to close by offering much thanks to our festival staff our interns, our fellows, for their work in support of uh, the festival for this program and also the programs that we have throughout this experience of Making Matters. So we want to uh, remind you to follow the Smithsonian Folklife page here on Facebook to get notifications about future events and find us also on Instagram and YouTube. Visit our website and come back here for the next program. And also please use our chat uh, and uh, visit the websites and the Instagrams of these wonderful artists as well. So thank you, uh, Diana and Jai, signing off. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.